I'll call the meeting to order of the Narragansett Academic Administration Subcommittee. Uh, we will, um, we have in attendance, um, Margaret Hughes, School Committee, Deborah Kojal, School Committee, Superintendent Kazabant, Assistant Superintendent Kate Kalise, and um, High School Principal Kobe Young. So, our, we do not have our minutes from March 9th. We will be approving those at our next academic um, subcommittee. So we'll move right on. I'd like to suggest that we do the program of studies, the ongoing go to new business first, and then go back to program of studies. Is there any objection to that? Nope. Okay, thank you. So we'll start with the FY22 budget high school music position. And what I'd like to do is ask Superintendent Casaban to give us um, some information on what is included in this budget. We know that we have the two positions, but how are other aspects of the music program handled under the budget, such as stipends, et cetera? Thank you. Um, and again, I, you know, I reread um, the letters that were um, presented at the last school committee meeting because you know it, it'd been a couple obviously been a couple of weeks and I wanted to make sure I I you know had the right frame uh, to to answer you know any questions or concerns that folks had so I I think you know when we start talking about and I think in some of the in some of the letters it, it referred to cutting the music program okay. And uh, so what I want to say to you is we have not at all cut the music program. We have certainly reduced the number of people, right? Of folks who teach music and, and by one um, in this, in, in, in our budget. So I want to make sure that, because I, I, there's a couple of things that I, I do, I want to push back on just a little bit. Um, so a lot of impassioned letters, uh, right. So, you know, talking about how music is very important and it's important for kids and it's important for the community, which I absolutely agree. And, you know, and quite frankly, have been, um, you know, I'm a I'm a cheerleader when it comes to folks who can sing, uh, play a musical instrument, um, act, uh, because I can do none of those things. So I, I have often told them I'm very jealous of folks who, you know, who, in fact, can play a musical instrument. But I want to make sure that you know we 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 kind of frame this you know in the um, in the right light. We've done a lot with the music program, quite frankly. So what have we done, right? So everyone knows at this point that we've co-opted with Murdoch. Um, both bands were struggling with numbers. Um, we reached out a couple of years ago, and um, from my perspective, it was um, very successful. Now, granted. We haven't seen a lot of that, and that has to do with COVID, but that still exists, that co-op. Um, we, also, we also purchased two vans two years ago, actually it was, pardon me, last FY, um, for, uh, for numerous reasons. Um, but one of them uh, was, one of those reasons were to hopefully help shuttle kids back and forth through the band program. And we've, we've talked about that. Um, and what I also want to make sure is that we have added several stipended positions to the, uh, to the arts um, in its totality. So, you know, uh, if folks remember, I have my list right here. It's in the back of the, of the contract, obviously. But, you know, especially around the play, um, there were many positions that were not funded by the district. It was, it was really out of the pocket of whatever the, um, of whatever the door was and so we added, for example, um, a business manager for the music and play because you're talking about something that takes in tens of thousands of dollars, and so we felt that that it was important for someone to obviously oversee that. Um, we added um, there's always been a choreographer, but that person was never paid, um, or if they were paid, they somehow worked it out through um, through the door uh, what they took in. Um, we we have, of course, a percussion instruction uh, person. This, these are all activity coordinators, by the way, after school. Set design, musical play, there's, you know, there's um, uh, a position for that. There's the broadcasting club. There's the um, 
district wide TV production. There's the music director. There's also the marching band director, which we've, 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 which we've had for a very long time. But what we also added is we added, we took a couple different uh, positions and we combined them to teach, um, uh, I wanna say it was percussion, but, it was, but we named it an assistant band director, but it also took on many other little duties. And so to give whoever is with the band, I'm trying to find it actually, but I can't find it right. Oh, color guard, assistant band director. So we, we combined the color guard and I believe there was also um, another position that we combined. So we've actually added two or three or I, I think four positions um, through um, after school activities. So I, I, you know, in one quick broad brush, I'd say, look, we've done a lot for the arts. We've tried, we have tried where we can to, um, to not only accentuate, but to literally add positions that people um, can be active in the music and the theater programs after school. The other thing I wanna make sure that we talk about is that this position. So what happened, um, and I, we talked about it during the school committee meeting, Jody Clapp really ultimately was a point four music person. When you look at what Jody Clapp did, right? So we've already talked about all the things. He project lead the way, he taught a math class, he, you know, he, was, he taught a science. I mean, he, he was a, a jack of all trades. But when you looked at what he represented to the music program, he really was only a point four, okay? So we all knew that um, our music program really hinged on, you know, if Jody, well, not the music program, but all of these things were really reliant on one individual. And that's never, that's not a good way to, of course, manage um, anything because now you're, you know, you've got a lot of different, a uh, lot of different needs um, tied to just one position. That's never, you know, that's not a smart thing to do. So Jody, you know, he moved on, which is, you know, uh, to a, a bigger high school and he's going to be the band director. He is the band director. So that presented us with an opportunity because when we looked at the position itself, point four, what we really needed was a 1.0 um, science. We needed that because we do, we cannot offer, um, you know, uh, help me Colby, not trig, uh, not, um, it's physics. I'm sorry. We, we needed a physics teacher. Yes, we don't physics. have, any, we don't yep. currently have anyone who can teach physics. So it made sense to take that position, the monies we were spending for that position and dedicate it to the physics position. Because we had two music teachers at the, at the elementary, uh, the middle school, it simply was moving one music teacher to the high school to cover, the, you know, to cover all things music. And of course the band director, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so in terms of a cut, I would say that we did. We cut a point for music position, but what we added to the district in totality is a physics teacher. And also we're now offering Spanish at the middle school, which we did not have before. So that actually took place last FY, right? Because when people were talking about what are we going to do with this unified art position? Certainly we, we scoured the landscape of what could be offered for unified art. And it was clear that we needed a foreign language because we did not offer a foreign language at the middle school. And not that just a lot of middle schools offer a foreign language, they do, but academically, it's, you know, it's important that we get, we at least have that uh, as an offering at the middle school. So that as they progress, that they can get to AP Spanish in this case, which we were not a really able to offer because we could not, we, we did not have as many years as we needed, we needed to that fifth year. And so we thought academically, we took care of a lot of a lot of needs. I, I will say from the music perspective, we are still in this, I think that we're just as well off as we were. Um, because as some of the letters said, like, what are we gonna do about um, chorus, for example? Well, there's an opportunity to do chorus after school, right? Um, there is opportunity to do chorus actually during the day. I don't know what the middle school's, you know, uh, music teacher, what his, you know, penchant is or where his skills lie, but certainly between the two music teachers of the middle and high school, they can, they can figure um, out a way to be able to offer that 
maybe as an elective or maybe a unified art, depending on the schedule itself. Um, but I don't, I don't believe that we've really taken a step back. I really don't. Um, many, much, much of what generally happens with extracurricular activities, and I'll throw in sports for, as an example, happens after school. It doesn't necessarily happen during the day. And so I, those are the things that I would, you know, that I would just throw out to the, you know, to the academic subcommittee at this point. Um, I think that we met a lot of needs and we were able to keep our music program um, you know, on, the, way, the way I see it. Uh, it, you know, we're able to at least offer music at all levels, especially at the high school, where I realize it's very important with band, et cetera. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> do, um, do we have questions, school committee members? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Are we Mr. teaching um, instrument lessons to the students in the middle school? Are we teaching them how to play their instruments? Um, their individual instruments, I don't believe that we're doing that now because we don't, we can't have after school activities necessarily indoors. Um, and um, I know that there's music class going on and I know that they were working on um, percussion, uh, but I, I, I don't believe that that's there unless they just happen to be a percussionist. Have um, we started doing anything with the fourth graders? Um, no, okay. we did to prior, obviously we had a whole we had a whole, you know, program laid out. This is pre-COVID, obviously. Yes. Um, we've done nothing of, of the sort this year, of course, for, you okay. know, for all the obvious reasons. Is that something we want to do in the future? Maybe in next yeah. year? I mean, the we, year after next? We had a schedule um, to make contact with the elementary. Um, I, you know, quite honestly, I don't know how that will look with just four um, yeah. folks, right? I don't know. Um, I would really have to defer to all the building principles because it would of course affect them all but um it, that was part of the plan and we did in fact you know have a music night down there they rented in you know they went and did the whole uh, instrument rental um one night and um but again with covid we haven't we haven't do you think if we go back to school normally quote normally next fall that maybe lessons could be done after school sure I think that one of the, uh, I, when I look at all the stipended positions, and again, we don't, we don't make them up as we go, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, meaning I'm not gonna take something that hasn't been used, like mock trial, for example, and then just say, oh, we'll just use the mock trial money. We, we have, you know, we have a system in place. So, um, like we did with the nurses this year, I, I presented to the school committee you know, this, this idea um, of, of a stipend position for nurses. We could do the same thing for, for, mu for musical instruments um, for next year. That's, that's something that, um, that certainly I can bring to the school committee, which then it goes to the union as well, right? Because that's, it's a, all of these stipend positions fall under the NDEA. Okay. Uh, so, but there's, there is a mechanism um, available to do that. Thank you. Um, do we have further questions? I think Colby has his hand up. I'm so, oh, thank you. I can't see that. I'm oh, sorry. No, I should have. I just didn't wanted to follow protocol. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just to expand on something Dr. Cassavant said, um, and I just really wanted to be really candid about this. Um, you know, Mr. Clapp, when he took that point four position, he was teaching physics, he was teaching Project Lead the Way courses, and he was teaching music. And one of the hard things with the science positions in terms of licensure is unlike an English teacher where you hire an English teacher who's licensed, right? For science, there's physics licensure, there's biology licensure, and there's chemistry licensure. Biology tends to be the easiest to attract high quality candidates. So Mr. Clapp was a really talented sort of unicorn as we called him. So as Dr. Cassavant's mentioning, while we did lose the point four for music, the moves that he is talking about that are made actually gain us a 1.0 at the high school level, right? And then it also brings in a science teacher at a 1.0. And what we can do is we have folks qualified to teach physics who may not necessarily have that specialty licensure area, 
but we can bring them over. The other thing that we need to do is we need to expand our biology offerings as well because we have larger numbers coming up. Mm -hmm. And so those biology courses, that's our MCAS testing area. So we have sort of a real need coming down the pike that um, you know, uh, super in, uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Kalis has helped us identify. So you know, I think where the advocacy for the program is coming in, and I, I really do understand it, um, is, is thinking about those music positions at the lower levels in terms of the high school specifically where some of the moves are being made. We're actually, if anything, expanding um, the reach of our programming but depending on what level you sit at, it doesn't always feel that way. To the question of lessons, that is something that we have explored a little bit with uh, Mr. Hurst, um, who is our band director. And so I can't speak for the other building principals, but you know, if this group is behind it and I could work with you know, um, uh, the assistant superintendent on this, I do see a universe in, in, in which lessons would be possible at some point. But we would just, in, in full transparency, those numbers would need to look a little different because we cannot schedule a student lesson perpetually at the time if they're not necessarily getting credit. So it would mean that a teacher would have a very fluid, dynamic schedule where maybe they meet with the student on Tuesday at two o'clock because that's where the rotating schedule falls. So we would just need to be okay with that. And we'd really need to think through some contractual things as well. Um, but the idea of lessons is possible at the high school level for sure. And it's been explored with Mr. Hurst. So um, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I, yep, I, have, yep, I have a yep. couple of questions if you don't okay. mind. Um, I, I thank you Colby for outlining the high school piece of it because I was gonna make that same point that I think the high school ends up um, a little better staffed uh, in the music because we have given now a 1.0 as far as, as staffing. I guess I have the first question, I, the first comment I'm going to make is if we're going to look at lessons, I think that it's Quabbin that actually has an instrument lesson program. They have, it's actually a pay for program. Their students also do some of the treat teaching for a cheaper rate. And I think it might be worthwhile to hop over to their website and pull that documentation. It's a very interesting um, configuration they have. And it satisfies a lot of needs, especially around teaching the younger kids some instruments and um, potentially giving some of our students the ability, not even to earn the money, but also to have that, that leadership capability to teach. So I think just something to look at. But this, the second question that I just wanted to bring up was as far as then the middle school goes, um, we had two teachers for music at the middle school um, for four, class, four grades right? We had five through eight, mm -hmm. right? Now we've only got three grades at the middle school um, and one teacher. So I'm just curious what, um, and, and I don't know if you have the information in front of you, because I know we're still working on schedules for next year. You know, what is the impact to those three grades by pulling that resource? Do, are we going to have um, less students involved in a music program? I know that we've added the Spanish teacher, um, which now gives us another UA to rotate in. Um, and I'm just curious if we have any idea yet what that might look at the middle school. And I know Rayanne, I'm sorry, Deb asked about elementary and that. So that's kind of taken care of with my question on that. Um, but I guess it's the middle school that I'm kind of focusing on what their impact is. I think if I draw the parallel, which I realize in, from, from some corners of this conversation is used as a... Um, uh, is a negative correlation. But if I use athletics, right, as an example, um, athletics take place after school. Yes, we have PE, of course we do, right? And, but after school, you know, when things were better, right? When, when we, we weren't in COVID, we had, um, we had intramurals, which, was a, which were a huge success. Um, and of course, we all know about the middle school sports program, et cetera. I think that that's, exactly where much of this has to go is that if uh, whether it be lessons or whether it be um, chorus or band or whatever that the the mechanism is put in place that someone can take up that stipended position and 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 do that type of work it makes sense i think it's equitable right so what do we have so far is that we have our play which is a 
big, big draw here at, at, the, at the high school. It is a major event, um, as everyone knows, right? We pack three nights, you know, three complete days of sold out shows. It's a, that's an important thing for the community, not only for the community, but for the kids. So from the music perspective, we, we can certainly look to that. Because I, you know, I like what Colby has said, is like, okay. Because I think that if we're, if we're just to be you know, honest about this, is that lots of times for electives, it's hard to fill music electives. So if I'm teaching US History One, which it's, which is, you know, you have to take US History One, but, but I've got a class of 30 or 25 or 25, it doesn't matter. And someone is taking beginning guitar, which I would love to take, quite frankly. Um, but there's only five of those kids, right, who take, it starts getting into this equity piece where people start looking internally. I'm talking about internally looking going, huh, I got 25 kids. How come that guy has only got eight kids or nine kids? It do, it's still important. Whether there's eight or five or 25, it's all important. It, it is because music is important. History is important. I feel like I could just go right down the line. Art is important. You know, all of those things. So I think we need to start turning our attentions to using a model like baseball, okay? Where there's a, people are playing baseball after school, right? There's coaches, there's, they're there for X amount of hours. They play X amount of games. You get the idea. I think that that's truly the way we look, we should be looking at it. Um, I have heard about Quab and I have looked, thank you, uh, Margaret, because I, I had forgotten that I actually looked at that document because we looked at it last year, quite frankly. And I go, oh yeah, that's right. We read all about this. And there's this great opportunity for some of our older students um, who are accomplished musicians, but at least have more skills than say the third grader or the superintendent, quite frankly. Um, and they could very well be a, you know, it, that's a great learning example, uh, not example, pardon me. It's, it's a great learning opportunity for everybody involved. So I think that, one, we have the music people here to, um, to provide the, the, the in-house during the school day musical program. I think in order to enhance it, what have we done? We've partnered with Murdoch um, and we, we're, we're actively looking at creating more of a presence after school. And I think that that would, I think, would be the next step, quite frankly. But as Colby has just put, out, uh, just, you know, put forth, those positions that we that we have just um, talked about, they are they are just as vitally important um, to the whole, you know, to the round, you know, to to the entire child, quite frankly, but to our academic um, pursuits. So I think that that's where I would, you know, I su would suggest the committee to to look into, and, and of course through me, I would imagine, but um, to look into how does that work, um, and what what would that financially potentially mean and what can how can we use our current music people right to to span to span k through 12 if that opportunity exists thank you <clears throat> further questions i can't see so margaret if you'll help yeah nobody's um, got a hand up so you look good thank you um i have a question um financially how are we helped by partnering with Murdoch? Besides increasing our numbers and interest, uh, it's wonderful, but what do they bring to the table for Narragansett? So we never got this far because we only had one year, but just like when we co-op with soccer, which we did um, this year, we split the cost of the coaches, right? So. It, it was, it was a perfect storm for the boys soccer team. There was mm -hmm. a coach from Narragansett and there was a coach from Winchenham. Now that won't happen every day, right? All the time, but that was a, per, that was a perfect scenario. If you're gonna have a co-op, that was perfect. So what we did is we combined the salaries and we just literally split them down the middle. We were, Joan and I were, uh, Ms. Landers, Superintendent Landers, uh, were in conversations about doing the same exact thing with um, the band, um, director because you know we both saw you know that that we were you know uh we saw a balance to this and we also saw an opportunity to maybe 
split costs. And by the way, utilizing their, te their music person as well, who is a very accomplished singer. So her chorus, and I have sat through many a concert up there, um, she is phenomenal. So we talked about sharing those, those like services. It, it all, you know, we all know where we're at now, but those, those programs are still, or those ideas are still alive um, because that's, that was the, you know, that was really the plan. So we really started talking about cost sharing and that of course saves money, but it also, you know, but it also starts, you know, driving these numbers up a little bit. And um, you know, this is why kids come to school, right? Some of these things are why kids come to school. Agreed. So for the general public, where can they find, I know we advertise when there are openings for these mm -hmm. stipend positions, but where can they find what positions you referenced and um, the salary for those? So, and well, everything's discoverable and certainly could someone do an information request. I, I'm, I'm looking at the contract right here, mm -hmm. but the order of how this goes by contract um, is that it's an NDEA position. It would be posted internally for the NDEA. No one's from the NDEA should um, want to, you know, want to be or take one of these positions. Then it's opened up to the, in essence, to the general public. And what we do is we post, we really do only post, um, you know, via the, our Facebook, our website. Yes, there have been opportunities where we've posted in the paper on some of these, you know, in, in the local newspapers, but generally, if it makes it out of committee, if I may, uh, through the NDEA period, then then we would, of course, open it up to um, to the entire community um, at large. Brian, may I? Yes. Um, do you think so? I think we we've I think the all with the amount of comments uh, and uh, communications that were sent about this, I think it might be a good idea to report back to uh, the public at our next mm -hmm. school committee meeting. What I was wondering then, would we be able to provide a listing at our meeting with what those positions are that we're considering? And, and we all know that everything's subject to, to the budget because um, I mean, we, we may end, if we don't have any money, we don't have any stipended positions. I think everybody realizes that. Right. Um, but what the, uh, what the positions are that we're looking at as far as having, um, funding for for next year at this point. Um, again, we understand subject to change based upon finalization of the state's budget and passing of ours at the town levels and everything else. Um, and I think that would perhaps be a good response back to the public that's written in to say, okay, you know, kind of summarizing our conversations here. I think Dr. Kazimant, you've done a nice job um, presenting, you know, what, what the music program will look like at all levels. And here are the things that we hope to be able to accomplish based on what we have already in the contract for mm -hmm. positions um, and the commitment to look at how do we include instruction going forward, what kind of, you know, that we're going to look at some kind of model that might work, as well as if we need to increase stipended positions um, for specific items as they're identified. And I think that would, would help um, put the information back to the community to let them understand that the music program is still every bit as important um, to the committee and to the district um, as a whole as it ever has been. And um, based upon the conversation today, you know, it's one of these juggling acts again. How do we ensure we have, you know, the, uh, for the, you know, I'll go back to what Colby said, we, we, we're going to have larger class sizes. We need more biology teaching support. We've got to have the physics. We project lead the way. Kate's always saying we, we're going to continue to expand. How do we, how do we balance, mm. you know, keeping all of those, I'll, I'll say they're, they're non-core because the state doesn't do an MCAS on them, but they're just as important as these oh, absolutely. other. Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is the, there are many wonderful things about being a small district, and, I'm, and I mean that. Um, there's also challenges. What we know uh, in small districts is that we all wear several hats, and we have to. You know, uh, the music person, we're just talking about this, right? So this, you know, would have to wear, a, would, again, in the perfect world, we'd have to think about how could we spread out one person or two people, and what could that mean? And we, you know, we're, you know, we're bringing in um, you know, folks from other districts and other, you know what I mean? So we, but, but it's important, right? It's important to do that. Athletics are in the same boat. 
um, you know, we have an athletic director that is splitting, um, you know, time in a very challenging, you know, project lead the way field. Um, it, but, but my point is that we know that those type of things need to happen. Um, and I think that we just need to be smart about it uh, and offer what we can. Um, at some point, someone will make the decision that it's either not enough, just right, or too much, um, just like the three bears. Um, and, but we, all we can do is offer the services that we can. I think it's important to offer them though, uh, you know, because it is the reason why kids get out of bed every day. And a lot of, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so if, if someone just lives to sing, we need to, we need to somehow create that opportunity, right? Um, play football, basketball, cheerlead. Uh, I, you know, I could go down the list and it makes them, you know, a, a more well-rounded citizen, which is one of the primary goals to school. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come, I'll come before the, you know, we'll, I'll report out, um, talk about these things. It'll give me an opportunity to talk to the new superintendent in Winchenden. There's an interim, um, there now, uh, and, uh, Joan has stepped back, although she's still present, but I, you know, it'll, it'll help me, you know, it'll give me a good reason, uh, quite frankly, a good excuse to, uh, um, to give him a call. Rayanne, just so you know, Colby has his hand up. Okay. Yes. Colby. Rick, uh, thank you, Ray, and thank you, thank you, Margaret. Um, so, um, so for for everyone here, I just to understand my marching orders, and obviously, you know, I'll take them from Doctor Doctor Cassavant. Um, am I understanding correctly that this this committee would like us to explore lessons, is uh, you know, in, in potential structures? Am, am I taking that away correctly? I ask because we're building the program of studies very much now. So now would be the time. And uh, Mr. Hurst has looked into, um, you know, the some of the programs that Ms. Hughes mentioned. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm inferring the correct things, because um, I can certainly explore that from a scheduling high school perspective. Um, I think that's um, a conversation beyond just high school, right? Whether we offer lessons, where we offer them, what grade levels, and so forth. So I think that um, you know, that's something we would all like to do, but it needs further exploration. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Felice. Yes. Um, I, any other questions? I just have one more. I've had um, a couple contacts. And the question they had uh, parentally is, what about the CARES money? Can't the CARES money help us? So maybe at the next school committee meeting, and we can explain the parameters of CARES money. It's just not out there to be used for. It has definitions of use. So would that, yeah. would that be um, something that we could entertain for the next school committee meeting? Sure. Yeah. Uh, because the general public just thinks that this extra money is out there and can be used for whatever we deem, which is not the case. So if there are no further questions, then we'll take um, this to the uh, general school committee meeting next Wednesday night and uh, report on our conversation. Are there any further questions? Sounds good. And I thank you all very much for the, um, the discussion this morning. So following that, we have the program of studies that um, Principal Kobe Shask Young just talked about. So we have an update, um, K oh, MIA eligibility and student participation. So um, who, Dr. Kazabin? Um, uh, certainly I'll just kind of give it the, the, the preface and I'll let um, uh, Mr. Young talk about this, but Ultimately, what it what there seems to be this um, internal uh, fight, really, um, or discussion about whether or not to hold students this year okay, to the MIAA standards, academic standards. So every year, we every district says, "Look, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna follow the standards," and we, you know. We say that and we do, um, and that allows us to enter into tournament play. So playoffs, basically, okay. Well, this year, uh, given everything that's going on, there's, there are 
many of us, and I'm tipping my hand, quite frankly, uh, I'm not really tipping my hand. This is how I feel about this. I, I do not believe that this year is the year that we should hold students accountable by the MIAA rules. We have done so every year. This is not a traditional year. We don't, some of these kids, we, you know, we're just trying to get them back into school. Never mind, you know, and if they come for football, cheerleading, basketball, high live music, I don't care. If they're coming into this building, that's important. And that's, and that is the most important thing that, that we can do now. And I'll let Mr. Young take it from here. What the committee needs to understand is that I, I think the MTA and many others um, feel that by uh, watering down or not following this standard um, is, is an insult to the work that they're doing as educators. Um, so in other words, and quite frankly, what do I mean? Well, so-and-so is gonna play track and field and he's got a 12 average you know, um, for, you know, for science. I'm just, I, I am literally making that up, but maybe I'm not, maybe I've hit it just right. Um, you know, my take and in the take of many of my um, colleagues is that we're really focusing on the social emotional well being of kids this year, just getting them back in. Um, the state itself has said that, you know, for example, in terms of retention, they are saying that we should not retain kids at all because of COVID. Um, and so there's a body of work from the state that says, look, we're just really trying to get these, you know, trying to get students acclimated back to the school and trying to their social emotional well-being. And there's another group that says, well, we need to still hold them accountable for the academics. And that's why these rules are in place. Um, and so there is there is a division. Um, but, you know, that's really kind of the overview uh, of 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 what, you know, the, the basic discussion is about. Okay, any comments? Uh, if I could, would, would I be able to add a little bit of, of further context in sure. terms of what I'm, what I'm so, so I asked to come before this group and um, Dr. Casavan and Assistant Superintendent Calise have been really supportive in hearing the perspective of the high school. And um, I, I really wanna be candid with you all sort of um, in regard to, to what I would like to do in my current role, um, perhaps with the blessing or not of the district. Um, this is a, um, as Dr. Casavan alluded, this is a, um, a quietly um, pretty, pretty behind the scenes. There's some, there's some folks that are really upset. Um, the context was another school asked, frankly, principals in a league, hey, we heard that um, schools are violating MIAA this year. Are you, right? And several schools weighed in on that. And um, some have received violation letters. I wanna be clear that Narragansett hasn't received any MIA violation letter or anything like that. Um, but schools have quietly um, been incredibly flexible with eligibility this year. And it's been a... Um, unspoken kind of quiet thing. We um, have been doing our best to support students and adhere to eligibility to the point where we've been in the uncomfortable position of having students not be on teams anymore, right? So one of the things that has come up is I don't know that anyone has weighed in heavily with MIAA and said very directly, we need you to consider lifting the eligibility requirement. MIA did lift eligibility requirements for the fall season one term. So they did, it's not without precedent. But really the three reasons that I outlined that I outlined in, um, in, in the letter to you all is one of our biggest challenges is this year is student mental health to be incredibly candid we're just trying to get students through the year and mitigate the, the circumstances to them. And we have students in this district and statewide that frankly are not coming to school. And we do home visits, we follow up, we call, we set up counselor, these counseling visits, we do everything that we can do. But for some of them, the, the mere opportunity to play sports 
is what will get them coming to school. And we have direct examples of this. Student mental health. So we've introduced a mental health screener this year that's new to the high school and the district. And we know that some of our strongest students and some that have historically struggled are really struggling in a profound way with isolation and things of, of that nature. And sports is frankly just another athletics are another level of inclusion and participation and getting students out of isolation. And so I don't blame in any way, shape or form the MIA for not acting on this earlier because they were just trying to figure out like the whole state was, are we even gonna be able to hold sports, right? And so I'm privy to these conversations where people are getting very upset behind the scenes but what I lament is that I don't know that anyone said, hey, this is incredibly important to us. Um, so the reason that this is coming up now is prior to the spring season, there's been no tournament play. So if any school was to get really creative, when you violate the MIA protocols, you essentially forego any tournament play, right? And because there has been no tournament play, Schools have been able to be incredibly flexible, but now with the spring season, they have reintroduced tournament play. So when we hit term four report cards in just over a week, we're going to be in a position where students that are going to be ineligible, right? If they remain connected in any way, shape or form to participate, the challenge that we're going to have is we need to make a decision on okay, are we going to continue to hold the line and you are not going to be able to participate now with term four? Um, and, and within MIAA eligibility, you can set up contracts so students can sort of stay connected with teams. But when you come to tournament play, if that student plays in a match, you now have to make the decision to forego your tournament participation. Um, so on three grounds, really, to be protective of students, social, emotional health, um, grades, the other, the other piece is grades. So when a student answers a school, when a school answers whether they're in compliance or not, districts are doing very creative things around grading right now. So some of our colleagues down the street are literally saying a failing grade is a 60. So that student is now eligible per MIAA, but their floor is a 60. So schools are doing, you know, very different things. And I'm bringing it to you all because as a high school, we don't want to do anything sort of secretive or behind the scenes. You know, um, we want to be really transparent about what we're doing. So what I'm seeking from this group is sort of on those three grounds. Number one, the student health. Number two, grades are somewhat arbitrary this year. And... Um, Number three, inclusion, students haven't had events. To from the district, I'm, I'm really seeking some support at the district level that perhaps we write a letter to MIAA calling for them to consider lifting eligibility. And if that's a, a private letter or an open letter, ideally I would like an open letter. To be candid, I am stunned that I haven't opened the globe or something like that in a bigger school like Boston or some, you know, BPS or something, I'm stunned that I haven't seen this because I know behind the scenes that a lot of superintendents, I'm aware of, of some other districts that um, have said, you know what, we're going to voluntarily forfeit games in advance because we want to be very clear that students can participate and we don't want to do anything behind the scenes. You know, we don't want to get a violation letter. We don't want our own membership mad at us. We want to be really upfront about things. Um, and again, it's coming into a head now just because of the introduction of tournament play. So I do really respect the position of some teachers, um, which, you know, you know, we're trying to do, we have credit recovery, as you know, set up. We're holding terms open so that students can, we're doing all we can to engage students. And I really, as the school principal, see athletics as another lever of trying to, to engage students. So I have deep, deep concerns that the position of the MIA right now is, frankly, um, going to jeopardize um, 
jeopardize things. And, and you know, uh, from, from this administration standpoint, we, we really need those athletics, um, you know, as a lever. And I would also add, and this is sheerly a political, just sort of a statement of things that have happened out in the cosmos. Um, the federal government has given stimulus checks to adults. Mortgage payments have been given greater flexibility. Corporations have been, you know, given loans. And so one of the things, I mean, no political bias when I mention it only to the fact that these things have come up for adults. And so I'm seeking for students to have some similar latitude that I'm a little bit surprised, frankly, hasn't come from the governing body. But I don't know that the governing body has been formally approached about this. So that's sort of the wider context and I appreciate everyone um, hearing those thoughts. Thank you, Kobe. Sure. Lot to think about. Um, does anybody have any um, comments right now? I do, if you don't mind. Um, yes, my I'm gonna ask a rhetorical question so it doesn't need an answer, but does anybody think that taking athletics away from a student, especially now, is going to make them perform any better academically? No. Again, the fork uh, doesn't need to be answered. Um, I, I am actually a little shocked um, because this is something that certainly I never considered, um, but knowing the MIA and sometimes the vacuum that they operate in, it's probably not surprising that they have not addressed this uh, in particular. Although you did mention they did, they did make concessions for the fall, what was it the fall one, I think it was called. Yes. Long term. Um, and I think that somewhere, somehow, and if that needs to be through our district, that this gets brought to the MIAA for consideration. Mm -hmm. I think it's the right thing to do. And I'm unfamiliar with all of the, um, the avenues and networks of how to approach the MIAA. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe our athletic director is, and, and yourself as the principal um, need to work together to make the first um, communication with them. I don't, I'm not sure how often the MIA meets and, and whatnot, um, but I, I think that we owe it to our students based upon all of the, the things that you've, you've brought out and the comments that Dr. Kazimian have made to at least appeal to the MIAA and say, you know, there's a few things more important than ending up with a, a trophy with the students that were all academically eligible at the end of the year for tournament play. That doesn't seem to be what we need to focus on right now. So if I was to make any sort of recommendation, that would be where my thoughts would go at this point. I don't know, Deb and, and Rayanne, um, your thoughts as well? I agree, Margaret. I, I had yeah. a superintendent's meeting this evening, uh, this, this afternoon, and, I, and I, I plan on asking them just, just, you know, just to see what, what folks are thinking um, from their, you know, just from the local perspective and beyond. Um, it's also a conversation for our teachers as well, I think through, uh, through the NDEA, um, quite frankly. I, I, don't, I don't know their position, meaning the NDEA's position on this. It's not come up in our conversations. Um, but certainly, you know, I would like, because what I do know is this, and I, you know, when I'm, it's being recorded, so it could be played forever, is that I know very well that there are teachers who are, all of them are, but there are teachers who have gone beyond, beyond above and beyond, right? Like, I'll call you at seven o'clock at night, just three o'clock or whatever, you just get one, thing, just literally over the, to get something and nothing has been, and, and very little has been, you know, offered either way. So I can see from a perspective, if you're working, you know, at 200 miles an hour here and you can't even get somebody to, re, you know, to respond to an email, which we know that they could, right? Um, because we, you know, we're, we know, we know this stuff now, right? Um, that, that it is, it, it can, it, it becomes, you know, I could see where this could be a point of contention. I'd like to talk to the NDA through our, through our conversations that we have weekly. Um, so that way I can, you know, broach the subjects. I, I would hate, I would hate to take a, I would hate for a position letter to go out and, and not to at least have had a conversation with uh, a formal conversation with the NDEA, um, you know, seeing that it's, you know, it's important, you know, I, I'm not necessarily, yes, I am very, I want to know what they have to say, but I don't, I don't know that it, it, it shifts, you know, my perspective um, on this, this current year. 
quite frankly. Yeah, and I just want to add that I certainly, with my, my rhetoric question, what not, was not devaluing the contributions no, of our, no. our staff at all, um, but I see this as working hand in hand together, mm -hmm. that the, you know, our, our, our staff plus our athletics and whatever other, you know, after school type of programs that are out there work together. And without them both going 200 miles an hour, I think we hit a brick wall with these yeah. kids. And they're both so important and they both feed off of each other. Um, but I think that, that your point is, is right on um, that we, we do need to engage the NDEA yeah. because um, it, it must be frustrating um, for some when they, when they sure. do, you know, the level of effort. And right. You, said. you know, um, I, I'm wondering about summer school as when you're talking to teachers, we, we certainly need to, to value uh, what they're doing in this. And we need students to understand the importance of finishing and doing the, the work that's assigned. So maybe high school, we could do something with extending, extending the time, a summer school requirement to do the work in essence, whatever, um, whatever they bring to the table. But um, yeah, you have to, I agree with the premises that have been spoken, but at the same time, there has to be some effort to get that credit. And well, if it means extending it into the summer, maybe that's something can, we can look at. Well, the ESSER three monies the demand basically that at least 20% of whatever monies we're gonna get um, will have to be dedicated towards um, I'm going to call it summer school, but but ultimately um, credit recovery slash you know um, kind of uh, filling in the gaps that type of thing. So, Ms. Trifolo, yeah. yes. Oh, I, if I could just say, just sort of for the committee's general awareness, we have um, begun a program of quote credit recovery, right, where students meet with licensed teachers evenings, virtual sessions, um, and or on Saturdays. So we are working on a lot of these kind of additional academic measures to keep students engaged. And some of the students right now, for example, are on academic contracts and the teachers have been really helpful in this. So to Ms. Hughes's point, yeah, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to misconstrue anything here as undermining the good work that our teachers are doing. The challenge that we're just up against is those summer programs or the evening credit when we hit roughly April 11th and the term changes, right? Once a student is sort of off the team, right? Then we might lose them. So, you know, per, per Dr. Cassavant's conversation with the NDAA, you know, I just hope that we can move as, as quickly as possible. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, with, with, and it's a whole other can of worms, but with the state guidance on events, if we are holding athletics, you know, if we're holding student athletes to a certain uh, standard, my concern is that standard should be held for all the other students for whatever mm -hmm. events we're able to pull off for them. And that discrepancy, I worry about a little bit too. And I just, as a, I have a hard time telling a senior who's going to do the credit recovery you mentioned, Ms. Trifolo, that is in, involved in that and is going to do it hey, I'm sorry, but I know you didn't have prom last year and we might have one this year, but you can't go because you're ineligible. Um, so just to add on, Ms. Trifolo, to what you were saying, we, we are doing some of those things and the challenge is the MIAA doesn't necessarily have provision to account for that stuff yet. So we're kind of up against it from, from all angles, if it makes sense. Yes, thank you, Kobe. My, my point with this recovery, obviously summer, doesn't mean that April 11th, somehow a designation on April 11th would have to be made that whatever number that's, that student has for that term is not valid because there's future work to be done that would be applied to um, three and four, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, obviously that all, that's good, but we can't say April 11th is a deadline is where you're going as well as I. That's the challenge. Once we hit a point, we have to decide for the students whether they're going to, whether we're going to play in tournaments or not, what direction we're going to go, right? 
and what I also don't want to do, what I want to be protective of our high school athletics is, you know, I don't want to try to do the best possible thing for students and then have a violation letter or something like that yeah. because we weren't kind of proactive in addressing things, you know. So in some districts are saying, frankly, hey, we're going to voluntarily forfeit in advance so that we're not in any violation of anything and everybody knows what we're doing and we're being really above board because it's important enough for all students to play right now. So that's kind of, those are the choices, yeah. And certainly in our conversation with the full committee, we don't want to just designate athletics. It would be no. any extracurricular. It's not one thing, it's it's everything that happens. Yeah. That's right. That, that's a very valid point, Kobe. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you. So we'll have that on our agenda as well. Um, so with Dr. Casabant, we're moving to uh, all of our questions for um, uh, Kobe presented. And we can move on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the report. Um, elementary school, Dr. Casaban, you've only been one day. This was the second morning. How's it go? Um, so it was great to see, uh, you know, 500 kids walk through that door. I mean, I, however yeah. many kids, but, um, you know, traffic, we, we 130 cars in the morning and 128 cars in the afternoon. Um, it was a little chaotic at, uh, at dismissal. But that's what happens at the very first day of school. And really, in essence, that's what yesterday was, was the very first day of school. Um, uh, teachers and staff did a fantastic job making sure everybody's in the right spot. Um, we'll, we, you know, we'll, get the, we'll get the kinks you know, worked out. Um, but we are full. Uh, the, I'll tell you, we, we've, we've packed them in there. Um, but it's, it's going well. And I think that we'll, we'll know more by the end of the week. Um, but as of right now, it's going good. Lots of happy families out yes, there. Yes. Thank you. And an update, please, on the middle school, high school return. So we'll be returning on the 26th. That's a Monday. Um, we are working towards, you know, the spacing and all the things that we need to do with seats, et cetera. We're, um, the schedule, it's, you know, have to be tweaked a little bit in terms of lunches, but we're, we're in good shape. And uh, we had, obviously, we had a little bit of lead time. Um, for the middle high school. So um, we've used that time wisely. Any questions from um, committee members? Thank you, I have a blank screen here. So I have to repeat that. Um, we had, as I'm looking at the agenda, uh, we have an ongoing event, which is the program of studies for students 21-22. Um, oh. Any updates if we need them? Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, Mr. Young has been working on that with his teams of teachers and so forth. We have a meeting for early next week to kind of do a stock take um, on that. And I believe it's um, going to be ready for the school committee after April vacation. Thank you very much. So we have um, the next date of our academic meeting would be May 3rd. Do we have any, any committee items and committee, anyone they want to bring up at this time? Anything new, uh, Dr. Casabant, is there anything you'd like to bring forward? No, I think that pretty much does it. Okay, great. Yeah, so with the, the, yes. the only thing that I just want to say for the public is just to let people know that we've used, we're using a different Zoom feature today um, and that oh. they would have the ability to click the link and watch us live, which, um, you know, we, we're in open meetings, but we struggle with trying to allow the public into the buildings because of all of the, the constraints we're still under with COVID. So this is the first time we've done that. So I just wanted to throw out if there's any uh, little hiccups um, or comments from the public, um, if anyone was able to join us to please let us know, and we're gonna continue trying this and see how it works. So I just wanted to, we are the inaugural use of our Zoom webinar feature, so. <laughs> well, thank you, Margaret. There are no comments on the screen, am I correct? No. Correct. All right, thank you. All right, with that, um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, Mrs. Kozel? Yes. Uh, roll call. 
Yep, mm -hmm. Mrs. Hughes. Yes, yep. And Sorry. Mrs. Triplo says yes. Sorry. <laughs> all right, thank you all very thank much. You, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.